thank you all for coming to the TEP seminar this week. Um, next week, just as a reminder, uh, Brittany Bass and, and Tim Young will be back. There's a flyer there about their uh, two talks. They'll be giving their uh, job market papers before they interview at the AEA meetings uh, next month. So it will be a, 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 a fun talk. Uh, this week, uh, our own Audrey Beck, who's a research fellow in, uh, in CHEPS and is a, a professor in the sociology department, is, is joining us. Um, this is brave, right? You're, you're, you're the, I think the first non-economist to, to give a talk in CHEPS, although it's sort of not fair, right? It's not, it's, <laughs> no, it's not really fair because you're so close to sort of a cousin. I mean, she has economists on her doctoral committee, does you know tons of empirical work. She's an economist in all but uh, I know that'll really just yeah. <laughs> so. so uh, uh, Professor Beck is here. She's, uh, uh, as I said, a sociologist who's published in leading journals in demography, the American Journal of Public Health, economics journals, economics and human biology, social science and medicine, social science quarterly. We're really lucky to have her here to talk this week about new cool data uh, that she's been involved in collecting that lots of future researchers and so we're going to be able to uh, uh, benefit from using. So thanks so much for being here to uh, present work on uh, police-related deaths in the U.S. All right. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we should definitely use our same procedures. So I know um, my new colleague, Tim Brown, is here, a criminologist for training. Um, what we normally do is, at any point, if anyone has questions, critiques, monologues, you know, whatever strikes your fancy, <laughs> I'm totally happy to entertain that. Um, I would also acknowledge that you guys might be a little out of your comfort zone today. We're primarily to talk about data. You might not even see an equation. It's going to be really fun. Okay. So this is joint work, um, P.I. Brian Finch, formerly of San Diego State, um, and is now at USC, and some other colleagues at USC, um, as well as some colleagues at University of Missouri-St. Louis. It's a really interdisciplinary team that involves sociologists, criminologists, former police officers, and our intrepid reporter that started this data collection many, many years ago, right, that we have to thank for this. Um, I certainly additionally welcome questions because of the stage of the product of the project that we're at. Um, we're at this point where we're merging together and collecting a bunch of different sources of data and we're making a lot of these critical decisions about what to include and how to measure things and how to like normalize things over time. So any critiques or feedback would be really welcome. So this is part of I'm a consultant on this grant um, and it has sort of three major aims and a very informative title. Um, which I can talk about later. So the first aim is to quantify police-related deaths in the U.S. And although this sounds relatively simple, the extant data is largely undercounted. It's been critiqued for being severely undercounted for many years. So we're going to fill that gap um, to the best of our ability with this new data. Is it, is it largely from the FBI that they're existing data is from? Or where, where, where um, we like? actually, there's four sort of governmental sources that I'll talk about, and I'll show comparisons and estimates in a little bit. Um, but yes, um, vital statistics, um, Department of Justice, etc. So we're going to show you how those data sources um, compare to ours, which is fatal encounters. Um, and I'm using this term police-related deaths. It is an umbrella term that includes the most common form of death, which is um, uh, sh shooting deaths, right? That's about 70% of the deaths in our data set. And then we have about 22% of vehicular deaths in, the, in, in relation to some sort of police activity. And then there's an assorted other causes, right? So um, a lot of the literature, a lot of the current statistics are generally sort of circumscribed to use of force or even shootings in particular. And so we have also some not only sort of better counts on those, but we also have um, some expanded causes of death as well. So that'll be interesting. Uh -huh. So are <clears throat> these expanded causes of death, are these just like like traffic accidents of a police officer might have yeah, so you know, collided okay. with another car and then someone died and that that's even if it wasn't during a stop or during some kind of so it's a mix. Vehicular ones, um, we actually have a lot of detail from you know, primarily these news articles that talk about the circumstances of the death. They are deaths due to pursuit chases, deaths okay. you know, in, in an accident of that nature. Um, and again, they're only sort of citizen civilian deaths. There's a separate data set that we're merging in that has officer deaths. Okay. Uh -huh. Is this data for on-duty police officers? Does it include off-duty police officers who happen to be involved in some sort of fatality? 
That's a good question. Um, I'll have to go back and see how we coded that um, as to whether or not, I'm pretty sure it's in relation to someone who's on duty, but that's, that's a great question because if that's something that we haven't thought about, we could kind of go back through the data and maybe create a variable like that. Um, But my sense is the bulk of these are on duty. Okay, so the main thrust of this project is to create this national police-related death database, and it's going to be sort of technically two data, data sets. Um, one is going to be the unit of analysis would be the department level, so it'll be aggregated counts of deaths disaggregated by race and cause of death, etc. Um, department level characteristics, neighborhood characteristics, and, and, and assorted other variables that I will talk about in a little bit. And then the second um, data set will be an incident level file, so it'll have characteristics of the individual who died, um, the agency or agencies involved, again, department characteristics, neighborhood characteristics, and okay. So I'll, I'll show you some of this detail in a little bit. And then obviously as part of our project, we're going to use this data and engage in some really hopefully interesting work, um, taking advantage of department level um, measures that we have over time and across geography. Um, we also have an additional controls that are often or at least sometimes lacking in other studies. Um, and I'll talk about those in a little bit as well. All right, so in terms of motivation, um, we know that police related deaths have captured a lot of public interest as of late due to some high profile <coughs> cases, um, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the sort of concurrent Blue Lives Matter movement. Um, and this sort, of, this sort of attention has led to a resurgence of sort of thinking about critical questions in this field, like are we willing, say as a society, to um, are police related deaths something we're comfortable with in the normal sort of progression of policing, right? How do we think about um, racial disparities in these deaths? How do we think about um, the conviction or lack of conviction of officers who are involved in these deaths? And, and critically, how do we think about reducing them when our underlying data is relatively poor, right? How can we think about the kinds of policies that might do so when we haven't thus far had really great data, right? And so if you've been reading this and not listening to what I said, um, you might, this quote might have struck you as something that could have been written today, right? So, you know, high, high profile social movements, social unrest, high profile deaths, um, critique of the current sort of existing statistics, and particularly a call to compare existing statistics across sort of data sets, right? And so this has been, we've been in this sort of purgatory of unexamined and poor data for well over 30 years, right? Um, this, is, this was written in 1979. So hopefully our project can shed some light or at least get us a little bit out of that. So on its face, this might be surprise, a little bit surprising because to demographers and even you know criminologists, counting homicides is something that's relatively simple, right? And there's a lot of agreement across you know, vital statistics and other sources. The, the limits of that, though, is that the statistics are actually quite good when we're thinking about citizens killing other citizens, police officers being killed by, by citizens, but the cases attributed specifically to police interaction are far undercounted and, and far less understood. So what is this? This is a figure sort of skipping ahead a teeny bit when you were using our fatal encounters data from 2000 and 2017 here um, to show the rate of police related deaths in blue um, and rates over here as a function of the total homicide rate. And this is police related homicide specifically, use of force, not, not the vehicular accidents and the like. Okay, and even though it's a relatively small percentage of all homicides, it's critically important for a series of policy questions. All right, so we can think about some of the stakeholders that might be interested in reducing police-related deaths. Um, certainly, we know that use of force is justified in many circumstances, um, but reliance on or even the perception that we have this sort of extra-legal death penalty um, certainly will undermine you know, citizens' trust in, in, the, in the police, in our justice system, you know, in our institutions in general. Um, U.S. is particularly exceptional in the fact that it, within a few days, um, U.S. police officers kill far more than police officers 
um, do over the course of years in other countries, right? And this exceptionalism has a cost, um, and both in terms of fiscal and psychological costs to victims and their families, um, to local governments and communities. We can think about the way that, you know, although it's relatively unexamined, the way that this type of violence, we're going to measure it as, as a function of violence, that this type of violence may additionally impact children and communities. Right? We know there's a literature on how and how neighborhood effects of violence and, and the like impact children. So we might think of this as one potential other source um, that could add to that sort of burden. We know that it impacts police departments, right? That these sort of deaths can erode trust. Um, there's some uh, sociology work that has found that these sort of high proximity to these high profile cases um, leads to declines in calling 911, right? So if people are afraid to call for help, um, if, they're, if they're less likely to report crimes, um, less likely to cooperate, this makes the department, you know, sort of doing its duty far more difficult. We also know that um, there's some literature documenting the mental health effects of police officers of some of these um, high profile deaths or, or just in general being involved in officer related shooting. And then there are some sort of satisfaction reports that you know, police who are engaged with a citizenry that is more cooperative and you know, has more cohesion, um, they generally report better not only job satisfaction but life satisfaction as well. Right? So there's, all these different groups that certainly have an interest in reducing these deaths. So what do we know so far? I know most, most of us in here are not policing experts, so I thought I would give you a little bit of background in terms of both some of the individual level predictors and um, the sort of structural level predictors. So in terms of what, um, what literature is found thus far, um, there's a huge body of literature that's primarily focused on individual level and kind of situational factors in terms of what predicts, given, you know, given an encounter with, with police, what predicts um, whether that encounter ends in the use of deadly force, right? And so they found you know, specifically that older um, female and more educated officers are less likely to use deadly force in the same kind of circumstances, um, that the, the alleged crime is something that predicts sort of the circumstances and number of other officers involved, um, let's see, so much here. All right, the training of the officer and other aspects of the officer's sort of satisfaction and attitudes, right? So we're not um, explicitly speaking to a lot of these individual level factors. We don't really have data on the individual officers involved, um, but we do know their agencies and other sort of structural department levels, factors, okay? So this brings us to the factors that we really can focus on in this project. Um, so what do we know? And again, when I say what do we know, this doesn't mean that maybe the evidence is particularly strong or good, right? But it's sort of theoretically driven ideas about what the relationship should be. Um, so there's sort of a, a deep literature on the kinds of things about neighborhoods that might predict either crime or more interactions with police, um, sort of social disorganization, violent crime rates. Um, you know, police per capita, racial composition of cities, um, even the kinds of policies that might be citywide, like for statewide um, concealed carry policies and the like. Um, we also have a lot of potential, like sort of nuanced relationships that could emerge between department level sort of structural conditions and police related deaths. And again, I should highlight that a lot of this literature is focused more on the shooting, and we might think that the mechanisms might be different for vehicular accidents. Some might apply in both circumstances, and some might not, right? So there's a huge literature um, from sociology of organization that's been applied to department levels in terms of organizational differentiation. So this includes dimensions like uh, functional differentiation, so how tasks are broken out of it into more specialized or less specialized units. Um, spatial differentiation, so the extent to which police officers have kind of a long arm into the community. Do they have 24-hour policing centers? Do they have a lot of beats? Do they have a lot of patrol cars circling um, and the like? Um, additionally, sort of vertical, how hierarchical in nature is the police department? Um, what's the concentration at different levels? 
And then we have some aspects of control and coordination that I think are especially interesting. So in addition to thinking about how centralized decision making is, which is, which is pretty hard to capture outside of sort of qualitative work, um, there is some work that suggests how formalized policies are. And this is something I think we could speak to, right? So do they have written policies on specific aspects of policing? And might that in turn impact um, behavior? So the, I have a question, I guess, yeah. on, the, on, the, on these dimensions, not knowing it um, myself, about yeah. sort of pol police training and heterogeneity across sort of a, a policies, not just across states, but maybe even within jurisdictions, about what kind of training the police get about when they dislodge, the, when, when, when they discharge their, their, their weapon, about the circumstances under which they're shooting to kill versus shooting to aim or something. Right, I mean, I, I, my understanding is that if you're going to shoot, you generally always shoot center mass with the intent to like immobilize the, the suspects, right? So I don't think it's an intent to maim ever. That kind of happens in movies and TV shows. Um, but like that said, the circumstances in which you would actually do that, I think, are, are probably varied in terms of their training. Um, and that's where the policies kind of come in that restrict when you know, when you should, you know, when you should fire or not fire, as the case may be. And I'll, I'll mention some of these in a little bit. But what you're raising another concern that I think is interesting is also how much variation there is across some of these structural determinants over time. And and my reading of the literature, um, although again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of digging into this too, is that at least along some of these dimensions, Departments are pretty homogeneous, very by size, right? So if you're looking at the largest departments, <coughs> they're going to be pretty similar along some of these dimensions. So I think you know one of the things we want to do is once we have all this data, is really tease out which of these sort of organizational characteristics vary over time across different size departments. That's something right now we don't we don't know, but I think it's a kind of a critical piece to like figuring out what might be um, like sort of explanatory. Um, we also have, we can also think about issues of composition. So again, sort of extrapolating, uh, or using one of the, the ecological fallacy, right? So extrapolating from the individual level sort of determinants, there's been some work that suggested, well, departments that are um, more female or more, uh, have, a, have a larger race ethnic um, mix, might be less apt to shoot or use deadly force. Right? So there's also some compositional arguments about the, the force itself. Um, technology is sort of an interesting theoretical area, right? So if we liken back to our sort of early methods classes and thinking about so the Hoffman effect, right? It, when you're observed doing something, you're more likely to change your behavior, right? So if we think about the kinds of technology that might monitor behavior, right, whether it's um, you know, body cams, other video cameras, um, a really sort of um, rigorous citizen complaint method, you know, sort of system, those sorts of things might in turn have an impact on behavior. Um, there's also some kind of interesting work that was done with a few select years um, using the 1033 transfers. So this is transfer of military equipment into police departments, and we can think about um, how that in turn might also impact behavior. So that's something <coughs> to kind of think about. And then, you know, as Joe mentioned, things about professionalization and what are the minimum education requirements, how much training do they have, what are sort of the sorting procedures, um, the, the various like you know, psychological exams, etc., that are required um, of departments. And then finally, probably most interesting for most of us are the kinds of policies that might be in place. Um, that could impact behavior, right? And so at least in the literature, what is often done is sort of a policy depth, right? A count of <coughs> how many policies they might have about you know, pursuit or use of force. Um, but there's also sort of piecemeal literature that examines like one particular policy aspect as well. Um, you know, also thinking specifically about the kinds of, um, not just the policies per se, but when you have to file reports um, and again, sorry, this is a little hard to see, but this is from, um, there's been a, a resurgence of sort of websites involving either police, you know, counting police deaths or police use of force. And I just wanted to highlight this because it's from a project <coughs> called Use of Force Project, and they surveyed 90, 91 of the largest, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Is there any literature that looks at the effect of like body camps? 
on any of these? Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that's um, right now <coughs> the existing data, um, which I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. Data was collected, I think, um, in one of the most recent Lima studies, and the 2016, one of them has a body cam supplement, and they're releasing that next year, and we're going to attach it to this. Um, so I think that could be really interesting, although, again, it's one point in time, you have some information, say, 2012, and then another one in you know, 2016, so there's a bit of a gap there, but I definitely think there could be, you know, the data hasn't been released yet, so there have been a few kind of supplemental reports, but not any sort of rigorous study, in my, at least in my estimation. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really interesting avenue for future work. Um, so this, is that it? So this project, for example, documented, um, went to the 90 biggest departments, documented various aspects about policy, so requiring de-escalation, the department has a use of force continuum, it bans chokeholds and strangleholds, it requires warnings, it restricts shooting and moving victims, it requires you to exhaust all other measures before. Um, uh, you have a duty to intervene if another officer is potentially using deadly force and then requires comprehensive reporting, right? Because we can think about all these dimensions potentially having different impacts, right? And so they documented across these 90, 91 some odd departments, and I put San Diego down here, um, just so you can see the guesses are blue and the reds are no, okay? So um, we allow, at least as of 2016, and it hasn't changed in the most recent year, um, you know, we allow strangleholds, we can shoot at moving, vic moving vehicles and the like, but this might be updated more recently. So do they provide the dates of when these policies were put in? So effect? this particular project, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think if we were to think about maybe supplementing our data with this, we would want to see, did they also collect information about when this policy went in place? Or did they just say, as of today, yeah. do you have a policy, right? But I think this is something that if this was, this kind of continuum was something you're particularly interested in. I think 90 police departments, that's not a very arduous data task yeah. to try to like track that down. Do you know the highlighted cities? The highlighted means that since 2016, they've made some changes. Okay. Right? So they put out this report in 2016 and then sort of retroactively said there have been changes. All right, but just to highlight, um, only um, out of these departments, on average, they'd only adopted about three of these eight policies, so there's a lot of variation um, in terms of what departments are doing. Um, and so what do we know today? There's a lot of, as I mentioned, kind of piecemeal literature on specific policies, but two of the most off-cited um, policy or policy directives were the structural changes that New York City made in the 1970s, um, particularly an effort to reduce fleeing felon deaths and, and shooting warning shots. And that led to a dramatic decrease in police homicides. Um, additionally, so the Supreme Court case in 1985, Tennessee versus Gardner, um, ruled that the use of deadly force to apprehend fleeing, unarmed, nonviolent felony suspects violated the Fourth Amendment. And that, in turn, has also been sort of lauded as reducing, reducing deaths, right? But again, a lot of this literature, both theoretical and empirical, rests on data that might be um, as I'll show you guys, a little, little questionable. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about these various sources of data really briefly. So we have the National Vital Statistics um, System, and <coughs> they count deaths by legal intervention. Um, we also have the univer uh, FBI Uniform Crime Reports, and this is what are considered justifiable homicides. And so you might ask what that is. It's limited to the killing of a felon by a police officer in the line of duty. Um, and these, kill these killings are determined to be justified by a law enforcement investigation. So they're certainly a subset of other remaining deaths. Um, we also have this National Violent Death Reporting System. And this is a new source. And it's determined to be, which I'll show you, it's better than sort of the existing vital statistics. Um, but um, a recent review also highlighted that it still is undercounting um, deaths, particularly in, in sort of a geographically um, heterogeneous way. Um, Department of Justice is now, these arrest-related deaths, is now uh, reauthorized as the sort of federally mandated to collect deaths 
that have to do with um, arrest-related deaths or deaths in custody. Death in custody. Um, this data set has been found to be under coverage by about 31 to 50 percent, and it's dependent on a single state coordinator that has to coordinate among all of the departments in the entire um, in, the, in the entire state. It also um, largely relies only exclusively on newspaper articles and does not additionally supplement or survey departments themselves. And then there's been this emergence of various websites, some of which are, you know, have pretty decent um, counts for a few years, and they are relatively recent. Um, Killed by Police, The Counted, Washington Post, and then the data set that we're in the process of creating and kind of putting together is Fatal Encounters. Okay, so let me show you some comparisons. Oh, well, let me show you a little bit more about Fatal Encounters. I know you definitely can't see this. Does, um, does but, death by legal intervention separate, like, police-related homicides from, like, state executions? Um, I believe, uh, yes. So those deaths are counted separately. Um, they're not included in these, right? So it's custody deaths not including any sort of execution. I was actually just reading that the other day. Huh? Are those exclusively police departments, or are you also looking at, like, Customs and Border Patrol? And so we do have, yeah, this is, yes. this is everything. This is Sheriff's yeah. Department, SWAT, I mean, like, this is um, sort of specialized task force at the state yeah. level. Um, the challenge with those, though, is we haven't thought about, we haven't really figured out how to grapple with those, because how do you attach department-level characteristics, or even state-level characteristics to those, because <coughs> aren't, they aren't, they're, like, statewide. Project. It's worried a little bit that in some geographic areas where, let's say, CBP has a larger presence, that mm -hmm. might influence sort of the, the deaths data. Yeah, so we can like, we can actually separate yeah. out the deaths that are due yeah. to Customs and Border Patrol, okay. um, and we could even think about, so something we're thinking about in our modeling strategy is thinking about sort of <clears throat> contiguous borders and correlation across mm -hmm. them. And, and so we might even think, especially along the southern or northern border, we might want to think about something additional um, how to figure out. So this is a little bit related to that, but um, how are you handling uh, like contracting uh, law enforcement forces? Because so, that's like, I mean, yeah. I'm from King County, which is one of the largest counties, and the Sheriff's Department has contracts with a lot of cities who on paper have their own police force, but yeah. it's entirely staffed by the Sheriff's Department all of the policies roll up to the sheriff's department for the whole county, and so it's like I've just I've been focused on that as you're talking. Yeah, no, about this that's stuff, something we nightmare. we've been kind of thinking about because we we have to you know they're attributable to whatever right now they're attributable to whatever sort of hat they were wearing when the death occurred, right? So if you're saying if they're contracting and they're currently sort of working as say sheriffs or they're currently working as city police they would be counted as city police. However, we do have department level characteristics that um, in terms of counts of how many of their officers are sort of these contract workers or sort of part-time workers. So maybe we could get at that a little bit, but we don't, we can't really like, uh, we could think about only maybe looking at departments that are largely, like are larger in nature that wouldn't have the same kind of contractual relationships. Well, I guess I'm thinking like maybe rather than it being an impediment, it potentially being something that you could leverage. Yeah. So if you've got like, again, say King County Sheriff's Department, who all of these contract city police forces are exclusively Sheriff's Department employees, mm -hmm. but they like drive around in a city police car, yeah. like their capital and all the equipment, they have like a police station that is owned by the city that they're working in but their policies are determined by the larger institution. Yeah. You could sort of perhaps get some interesting identification contrasting the department level policies against city level, like in which they're operating or in which the homicides occurred characteristics. Yeah, it, because if you could figure like, out you're going to have who, some endogeneity problems yeah. when you say like, oh, this police department authorized chokeholds, but it's in a it's in a city in which there's like crazy violence. Yeah. And so you're not going to be able to very cleanly identify the effects because you're going to have sort of endogeneity. But if you can maybe leverage some of these weird administrative like police department settings, you might be able to get something a little cleaner. Yeah, I think the tricky thing about that is thinking is, is if we don't have a way to identify them as being employees in both settings, 
right? But we could identify the locations as being more apt to have these kind of. I mean, since you're like, you know, not, uh, you're not scared of like the Googles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You could, you should be able to find out what cities are contract cities. Yeah. Okay. This is probably going to be largely determined by a very large sheriff's department. So, like, very large counties, I expect, would have a larger um, incidence of this type of administrative arrangement. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. We should definitely look into that. Um, and. Can you hear it? Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, give you some detail on the data we do have at the incident level file. Um, I knew when I put this up you probably couldn't see it, but this is sort of a snapshot of part of the data, right? So we have name, longitude, latitude of the death. Um, we also have sort of off screen the full address, street address, so we can like geocode up these uh, specific incidents. Um, we have agency or agencies involved in the death. Um, cause of death, a brief description, um, as well as their name, age, or wait, I already said name, age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, sometimes we have a URL image of the individual. Uh, we also have the um, judicial disposition. So this could include things like suicide, accidental, justified, um, grand jury, criminal. Um, a lot of them are unknown, but we do have a little bit of information on that. Um, we also have some information about whether, particularly in the article, if there was any mention of mental illness um, or that was the reason sort of cited for the police call in the first place. Um, in terms of causes of death, although we'll get into more uh, detail in a little bit, they mostly include um, shootings, tasings, vehicle, bludgeons with an instrument. We have some medical emergencies in there, overdoses, um, stabbing. Among, among others, right? But the bulk are mostly gunshot and vehicular, vehicular causes. Um, in terms of the data completeness, we have like less than 3% missing on name and age, um, less than 0.2% um, missing on agencies involved in cause of death. Unfortunately, we have about 35, 40% missing on race ethnicity, and I'll tell you how we're thinking about how to contend with that in a little bit. Okay, so again, this is just sort of, this is 2017, just to give you a geographical sort of snapshot of the deaths in that particular year, coded um, by race ethnicity. You'll notice, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but the purple is unknown. Um, and this gives you a sense of just sort of how the level of detail that we have on these incidents. So um, Miguel Angel Silva um, died, you know, February 1st, 2017. Police responded to report of gunshots and a man in the area of the gun. Police say Silva later made his way to Garrison's convenience store, held hostages, etc. Right. So we also have links to the news articles, um, among other details. Right. So there's certainly some some um, you know some opportunity to maybe pull additional information out of these news reports that we have not done. Okay, so how did we collect this data? About 80% of it comes from news media reports. Um, we've also done hundreds of Freedom of Information Act requests, um, as well as some of these incidents were crowdsourced. So there's a procedure in which if someone notices that we're missing an incident, um, they can report it and then we'll investigate it and decide whether or not to add it or if it's redundant. Um, we also use and cross-check against existing governmental data to see whether our accounts sort of align, are we missing any, um, sort of probabilistically, probabilistically sort of mixed cases and see whether or not we need to do some more digging to find additional cases. Um, we also spend a lot of time sort of identifying and purging sort of duplicates or other sort of problematic, uh, other sort of problematic cases. So how do these data compare? So I'm going to show you sort of across time. Um, as you can see, sort of first and foremost, the fatal encounters data has, um, alongside the justifiable homicide data, has the longest sort of sweep of, of years of data. I also have here a short comparison to these arrest-related data, um, arrest-related deaths. And this, of course, is this right now is all police-related deaths. So it includes vehicular accidents, includes all the different causes. Um, and we have about, about 1.5 more cases 
um, than the arrest-related deaths, and you know, somewhere around three times as many um, cases than just about the homicides. But of course, that's a subsection of all of these. Right. Um, you might wonder where these are coming from. Are we perhaps are the estimates perhaps a little bit closer on say? intentional use of force and maybe the gaps only coming from vehicular data collection right and that's to some extent that's uh, that's a bit true so the arrest related deaths and fatal encounters data it, our estimates are a lot closer when we just restrict it to intentional use of force um, as are the justifiable homicides right they're a little bit closer in nature I'm just going to skip across this next one um, okay so we've done some additional checks. There's an article, a recent article by Barber and colleagues, and they were most interested in comparing this national vital death reporting system, which is new and is, is for a lot of reasons, is better than existing data sets. Um, so they collected all deaths under, they had a very strict set of circumstances that they were looking at um, specifically, and then they compared those to what they got from the Net National Vital Statistics <coughs> and the supplementary, supplementary homicide reports, right? And so I've highlighted in red, in case you can't really see it, um, all the ratios below one, right? So by and large, National Vital Statistics and the supplementary homicide reports are vastly undercounting police-related deaths um, across all of these states that they sort of sampled. And then when we compare, we sort of added this comparison to, uh, to fatal encounters, and we find with you know, maybe one or two exceptions, we in fact um, are not just not undercounting, but have um, sizable additional counts for most states, right? Somewhere, somewhere pretty close, right? Um, and so what we did when we found this is we actually also went back to this data set in places where we were undercounting and tried to find those incidents and added them to our data as well. Okay, so let me show you a little bit more about this data and then how they're all merging together. Um, right. Just, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, just sort of back to that as an uh, other motivation in addition to your goals of trying to get a more accurate sort of count of yeah. these police related deaths. Is there any evidence from existing sort of policy work from, from some of these descriptives to lead you to believe that the, the estimated policy impacts that folks are, 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 are getting may be bias due to non-random measurement error sort of across these jurisdictions and reporting of deaths from these earlier data sets? That I, think, could... I, think the, the, I think the answer is we don't really know, mm -hmm. right? Um, because no one has sort of systematically compared it to maybe even better counts or, or really investigated to what extent specific states might have more severe undercounting or severe undercounting of specific types. Um, so. I mean, this would, I mean, this certainly suggests, even the sort of first blush look at the new federal system suggests, I mean, again, I don't know how these these, uh, these <coughs> undercounts might relate to the types of policies that have been investigated in the literature, but if it, if it is, it suggests that, 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 you know, more than just sort of not knowing, the sort of not knowing in a non-random way may yeah. be leading us down a road to incorrect and, policy conclusions. And particularly in some states, which you'll see later, there are some states that are sort of were initially sort of worse in terms of even our undercounting, so you know, Florida in particular, let's call them out. Um, but there are some states that you know we might expect the bias to be even like more severe too. So, but I think the issue is specifically what I was talking about that it's systematic or sort of some sort of structural omission because if it's just. And I was sort of thinking this when you mentioned that it's just sort of random yeah. and isn't seem doesn't seem to be correlated with the type of like type of death or like spatially where it's at. Then that and who would cares, be, right? It's just uh, yeah. it's, it's effectively your your any study yeah. using that is just like randomly sampling police deaths. Or something but it's like not that. random by geography and does not yeah. seemingly random by by cost, right? Yeah, and, so and, that's, and I think that's the like that's a much stronger mm -hmm. selling point for the data set is yeah. that you know there's there's systematic measurement error that's not just random, mm -hmm. which creates its own problems, but it's actually like the bias in certain estimates is especially acute. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. Thanks for framing that in that way. Um, I think in terms of <coughs> in terms of this data, additional strengths, which we should, certainly should add to this, right, is not only do we have a lengthy period of data collection, um, we have police department identifi identifiers, which not all data sets do so that we can link police department level data rather than just state or, or county level data. 
Um, we have this broader set of deaths, so researchers could decide to refine and cut their deaths in different ways. So the police uh, department identifiers, is that, do you have a lot of missing values on those, or are those almost No, those are, those are not missing. Um, whether or not we also additionally have department level data for those ORI codes, that is potential. But is that, is that just, you, you know the lat long coordinates of the death, and you say this maps into the police department? Right, well, we actually attribute it based on the agencies involved, and we also have like the lo latitude, lo longitude, right. right? So generally speaking, you're going to be attributed to like the, police, the local police force. I see, so if you have like a city police force and you've got a county sheriff and there's a chain, or like, because, because the police agencies will respond to each other's calls, right? Absolutely. Across, but you know, for example, if there's a shooting in San Diego, if it was like the county sheriff or if it was we know, so this is something where we grappled with too, is thinking about these like pursuits that have crossed sort of boundary lines, right? And we know who um, the shooting was attributable to, so who was sort of there at the end when the shooting occurred. Um, are those agencies always the ones that like started the chase? You know, maybe there's some variation there that we aren't capturing, right? Do they cross into another jurisdictional boundary or do they let but you, so you actually do know who, which agency is responsible for the death? Yes. Not just who was there, but who was actually, who the death is attributable to? So for the bulk of our cases, it's attributed to like one agency. When there's multiple agencies involved, this is another limitation that I'm going to talk about that we're trying to sort out, is right now the death is sort of split among them, but we're going back through and calling these agencies and calling reports to see if later was there a determination that could sort out some of these. Right, because right yeah. now it's like if there are two agencies involved, each gets 0.5, right? But we're trying to call back and see like could the death actually be attributable to only one? So it seems like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm like focusing on minutia, but it seems like that could be really interesting too. If you have multiple agencies responding to an incident, like, and the sort of guest agency might be more or less conservative in use of deadly force, that could inform policies about sort of agency cooperation. You know. Like. Yeah, and I think, but I think it's also interesting to layer onto that when, what kinds of incidents would multiple agencies be more likely to be involved, and might those be different across sort of different settings, right? And the availability of different agencies to even respond in the first place, right? So, yeah, I think there, there's definitely a lot to kind of tease out here. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that individual researchers could kind of refine this. Um, they could make decisions about whether they wanted to include certain deaths or not. Um, we have a lot of circumstances of the death, and we're constantly sort of error correcting and updating the data. But it is it's not perfect. Um, so one thing we don't know, but we suspect, is that not only is our data, but all data probably um, is higher missingness in early years, right? Because we rely primarily on newspaper articles, um, the ability to store these sort of articles on servers historically was probably not as good, so we think we might be losing some of these earlier cases that just got lost, lost to the internet. Um, so we're thinking about, so, you know, do we restrict our analysis to certain years or kind of as robustness checks, etc. Um, we know that deaths are only <coughs> one potential indicator of violence, so we're also doing a supplemental department survey. It's in the field right now. Um, we've gotten about 80 responses left. Um, hopefully they're the bigger departments, but we're still collecting data. So we asked them about rounds fired in the year. We asked not only just about citizens who are killed, but also those who are injured by rounds fired by the police, as well as police killed and injured by rounds fired during encounters. Now this data is actually especially police assaulted or killed is already collected elsewhere. So these are just kind of different validation checks against our data and other data. How are the, the, the police kill um, data? Are those typically pretty good and comprehensive? Yes, so that is actually something that has often <clears throat> been noted is actually quite excellent data. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, but they have, they have a lot of circumstances of the type of assault, um, whether the death was accidental or due to felonious acts. Um, there's a lot of detail on like how the how the death occurred. And what, about, what about the injuries by police? What do we what do we know about that from 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 existing data? The hospital discharge data? Is there anything sort of out there on that? No. Um, so <laughs> there's a recent uh, Vice News report that they actually collected some sort of 
quirky, but they collected data on injuries, and so we're not sure what the quality of this data is, so we're, we're also going to kind of check and see and kind of investigate it a little bit more. But that's, at least to our knowledge, it's really the only effort to collect injuries. Um, what is it that, so that paper, is it Roland Fryer that has a paper that looks at, um, at incident level stuff and whether yeah. it's a shooting or, I mean, I think that's probably just like for like one police department. So I think that's right. Yeah, yeah I think there, that, there's definitely like, so that would be interesting too, if, if there, is there enough of that data collection in different places that we mm -hmm. could kind of piece some of this together for a smaller subset of departments, maybe. Um, but I don't think there's any sort of widespread data collection on on injuries. Um, so the other concern is this missingness on race and I've already showed you this figure and highlighting all these purple all these purple individuals that um, we do not have information on their race and ethnicity. We do however know obviously their location and um, their name and so we're, we're trying a few different things. First we actually are um, we are asking the CDC, or the sort of research arm of the CDC, um, given that we do know all these other things about the death, when it occurred, the cause of death, et cetera, to see if they'll give us the race of this thing. Um, we're still in negotiations with that. But let's say that doesn't happen. Um, we're going to try this. Um, we try our hand at, um, in fact, our, our my colleague in sociology, Joe Gibbons, who does a lot of sort of spatial modeling, is working on this, sort of this Bayesian proved surname geocoding, um, which has been found in other research to have pretty high correlations with um, self self reported race, about 0.8 for Hispanic, uh, Hispanic individuals, 0.7 for Asian and white individuals, but only 0.6 for black individuals. So we're going to also add this in as another piece and include it as an option in case researchers want to use it because I think a lot of the interesting questions specifically for sociologists revolve around race and racial disparities and differences um, differences in neighborhoods and, and etc so to the extent to which our race um, data is is a sort of weak quality that's going to be an issue um, as I mentioned we're in the process of sorting out cases where you know, multiple agencies like U.S. Marshal Service and you know, Van Buren Police Department were both involved who actually, say, fired the sort of the shot, as it were. Um, and we don't know how, how far we'll get with that, but we're going to try to kind of disentangle some of that. <coughs> okay, um, one last sort of check to hopefully assure you that this data quality is pretty, pretty decent, at least relative to the other ones. We also did a FOIA pilot where we sent out an initial request to 11 departments in 11 states, and about 75% responded to that initial request, and we found that um, data in, in fatal encounters was complete in nine of those states. We were missing one case in Connecticut um, and eight in Florida, but these are, at least especially in Florida, this is a relatively small number of the total cases in Florida, um, given the population size and number of deaths. So, um, we're again we're supplementing this with this other department level survey to hopefully kind of piece together all these different ways of capturing um, police related deaths. Okay, so now to get into a little bit of description, I'm going to probably skip over some of this. Um, a little bit of description on the actual data. As I mentioned, gunshots make about um, are about 70 percent of of all the deaths. We have about 22 percent um, due to vehicle pursuits. Um, non-negligible percent due to tasing deaths, other uses of force. Um, we have a sort of a mix of medical emergencies and drug overdoses. We may think, you may think, well, why would, you know, I may not really want to use those. It could it be that police were just simply called to, called to um, a home and a medical emergency happened and then that in turn is what's being coded here, you know, potentially. So um, something to kind of think about. Um, we also have this determination of suicide. This is either a determination that was written up in a news article. We also have an indicator of whether or not it was sort of officially deemed a suicide. Um, as sort of two two different two different levels of certainty there. So does that, does that include like suicide by police officer? Yes. Okay. Yes. That yeah. wouldn't be categorized as a gunshot. Um, that would be. It would be categorized mm -hmm. both as a gunshot and as a suicide. They're not suicides are not mutually exclusive. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like a separate separate category. Yeah. 
So what does this data look like over time? Um, by and large, the only, uh, by and large, we see an increase mostly in the gunshot deaths over time, but for most of the other causes of death, it's been relatively stagnant, except for sort of a, a little blip in the vehicular deaths between 2012 and 2014. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, and this next is sort of other uses of force, like tasing and tasing bludgeoning asphyxiation and the like. The yeah. fact that you don't see any growth in medical emergency has me a little puzzled. Um, so we do see if we look specifically... I guess not medical emergency, sorry. I, that's probably it. The like, drug-related overdose kind of... So I think part, partly it's maybe part of a scalar issue, right? Because it's swamping. Like if I actually expanded it and just showed the causes of death that are really relatively small percentage, right now you're not picking it up because of the scale. Yeah, but it looks um, like... I mean, if you just look at the thickness of the blue band, it doesn't look... Maybe you're right, but it doesn't look like it's um, moving much. Well, I think we'd want to split out, and that one I sort of collapsed the medical emergencies and overdoses, but yeah. I think we'd want to separate them out. And you know, to your point, this is just suicides, and we do see a little bit of an increase at least like over here. So maybe you know we're capturing some of these overdoses, but we probably want to tease it out a little bit more. So these, so <clears throat> so if someone is seems to have overdosed, um, and you know, someone finds them, calls 911, the police arrive on scene, and then the person dies when the police are there. Is that, would that be counted in this data set as a fatal encounter? Yeah, so I needed to, I need to, add, that's a question to ask, I think, the person who originally coded. I know for sure what counts is if the police were called and the person, like, overdosed, like, in their presence, right? Or overdose as a consequence of, like, so like the, the police are here, I need to get rid of my drugs, and I yeah, consume or, them all, and then I, I die. Right. Because so I, I think what sure you're looking for is just an well, increased actually, flip for yeah, the Yeah, given like process. the opioid crisis, crisis yeah. I would expect to see like, you know, police, <coughs> if, if I'm interpreting <coughs> it in this way, like yeah. there's emergency calls because somebody's like out of it, and then they end up dying after the police show up. Right. Like mechanically, it seems like you'd have to have like a pretty big spike in those well, they, types of yeah, and, we, and there might yeah. be a spike, I just don't think it's like sizable enough in the data set for us to see. I mean, we do see like the suicide goes up a bit in the most recent years, but but I but I should tease that out and see what we see. It would just, I mean, I guess it would just you know, speak to some sort of like ground truth about yeah. what exactly that category is measuring. I, I think it is measuring, it's not, I don't think it's really measuring all potential calls in which police are called in there. Because if there's no overdose, I, my my bet would be that basically, unless the person is like completely dead, that's clear. my guess is that police are going to be on scene for any drug related right. call. Whereas these are regardless. actual, these are deaths, not ones yeah, in so they, they were, right. Yeah. Right. So my yeah, my guess is that that's not being captured. Um, just to show you, there's a lot of variation across different departments. So. New York, um, amazingly, um, relatively flat in terms of the police-related, this is police-related, all, all police-related deaths. Um, these are the largest departments. Um, LA, um, you see Houston has a sort of upward pattern, as does Chicago, um, as does Philadelphia, and then there's sort of decline here. To what extent were we, at least down, way down here, were we still in the process of capturing more incidents and inputting them, that, that, that sort of a censoring issue way probably at the end that we might see a lot to. Hmm? What's the scale on the y axis? The scale is, I think, out of, is it 100,000? Okay. Sure pretty sure it's Normalized by population. Yes. Okay. All right, um, in case you're curious about San Diego in particular, um, here are the fatal encounters in San Diego over the last you know, 17 years or so. The vast majority of them in blue are gunshots, a uh, handful of other causes, and red are these sort of vehicular accidents. Um, I also just want to show you another sort of variation, Sheriff's Department, which generally gets sort of different kinds of calls. Um, we see some differences here. Um, Sheriffs are also more likely to be involved in like the prison system, so also in sort of different populations, but a bit more vehicular deaths um, and <coughs> other causes as well. All right. 
Okay, so now I want to tell you about all the different data sets that we're kind of culling together in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes um, and kind of think about sort of how do we think about all these together. All right, so we're merging this data, this fatal encounters incident level file, with the census of law enforcement um, agencies, the law enforcement management and administrative statistics, the uniform crime reports, the LIOCA data, which is the officers killed, um, census and associated traffic information from the ACS, as well as some other, other sources of data. Um, I highlighted this in gray because we, um, again, Joe Gibbons just created sort of a density of emergency rooms, right? So if you're worried that these deaths occur not because some departments are more likely to shoot or more likely to, you know, be maybe even good shots, but rather that they live in a place where there's not very many emergency rooms, um, that we can sort of maybe potentially eliminate as, as a potential sort of confounding factor. But that's also something that we can't share with others, right? But if you wanted to do something with us, we could use that data. All right, so give me that. So what are these different data sets? So the rich, um, these are sort of really rich department level um, data. So the, this is mandated for all police departments. The long form is given to a sample of about 1,000 of the largest police departments and about 2,000 or so of the smaller ones. Um, I, I have the Excel spreadsheet I can show you later. There's hundreds of variables across all these years. Um, information on functions, um, facilities, budgets, number of per personnel across all these different categories, um, screening tests during hiring, um, whether they're involved in community policing in different dimensions, the kinds of technology and computers, <coughs> the, kinds of, um, the kinds of sort of weapons, body armor, um, whether they're authorized to use sort of non-lethal weapons, all these different policy directives as well, right? So this has a lot in there. Mm -hmm. Going back to your data, you said you had something about judicial disposition, so is that like with the determination of what the death was, like it was manslaughter or whether it was a justifiable homicide or something like that? Right, so we have, we have whether, right, for example, if it was considered later to be justified, whether the officer you know, it went as far as the grand jury in potentially you know, charging them, or if they were actually charged. We have a lot of unknowns, right? So like incidents in which there was never another additional report on what happened. Um, although I'm guessing if you actually dug into circumstances, you might find more information on that. Um, but yeah, we do have we do have that map. So I was just saying it might be interesting, especially because you have all this rich kind of data on the police force level. Maybe there's differences across jurisdictions how these events actually turn out. Say you're given two similar types of deaths, and in one area it gets turned to be a manslaughter, the other one they say it's just about a homicide. Right, which said something also about their sort of prosecutor's mm -hmm. office and like the politics involved, and that would be that would be interesting. Um, some I've seen some data that also pulls in things about like a recently elected mayor or recently elected prosecutor and, and whether they're in election year, because that, that sort of potentially matters too. Um, we haven't done that, but it's another sort of direction to go. So this is collected about every four years, and then huh, something weird happened. So Nork was in, in charge of doing the survey in 2012, and what happened? We're not quite sure. So they never released it. It sounds like there was maybe something wrong with the sampling. So unfortunately, they not only did never release the 2012 data, but now they're off sequence. So they're collecting data in 2018. Um, so we have a gap there, at least in this data set. Fortunately, we have the Lemus data, which has virtually identical questions. They ask a lot of the same things. They don't always go into depth on every on some of these subcategories quite as much. But we have all of these that sometimes they're they're sometimes they're in the same year. Otherwise, they're like close in years, and then they sort of fill in some of these more recent years. 2016 data is coming out next year that we're going to add to the data as well. Um, something we're grappling with too, because these, um, we can really only see changes across these like two or three or maybe even four year spans, it's thinking about how we think of, think about that and, and model that when we're okay. We're also um, including uniform crime rates, which include total crime, violent crime, homicides, <coughs> property crime, and the like. Those are there annually. I'm going to actually skip over this. There's not, at least, you know, visually, there's not a lot of evidence that crime rates are especially predictive of, of um, police related deaths. Um, this is showing, so we sort of scaled our police related deaths for crime 
for um, crime rates, violent crime rates in the area. And we, so if you think about that police-related deaths, if they're sort of proportional to the violent crime rate, they should be relatively flat. Um, but if they're sort of outsized or disproportionate over time, then we would see an increasing, increasing line. But again, these are, these are pretty small, pretty close to zero. So not a lot going on there. We also are including, um, this is another way we can kind of supplement uh, department level information, is the LEOCA data not only has information on officers killed through a variety of categories, also whether they're assaulted and how so. Um, they also have a lot of shift and patrol and disturbance call information as well. Um, this just visually shows you the fatal encounters data increasing alongside this sort of uneven um, officers killed due to gun and stabbing um, conditions. Again, very aggregated. So what it'll look like outside of this, we're not quite sure. So I've mostly been consumed with um, creating the Census and American Community Survey data. Um, particularly, we're, we're, we're using a lot of sort of this theoretical driven work by Samson colleagues, so concentrated disadvantage, immigrant concentration, how mobile or unstable the population is in terms of residential stability. Um, we also include population size, education, you know, uh, proportions and the like. We created a variety of segregation measures, both by race, ethnicity, and um, by family income. And we have it at a variety of levels, right? So you might be worried about geographic boundaries changing over time. Um, so we have it both normalized and just sort of at the cross section. Um, the challenge, though, is that we have to linearly interpolate, or right now we've linearly li we've interpolated in a linear way. We could definitely change that. Um, and I think we may even want to add in the 2005 ACS2, um, although we can't do then segregation measures for those. All right. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to show sort of a snapshot view of what our geotags sort of look like. You saw it at the national level. But I think there's some really potentially interesting questions um, adding to the sort of neighborhood effects literature. There's a lot on um, uh, looking at sort of health outcomes using these sort of national longitude health surveys and thinking about sort of contextual neighborhood environment. And I think adding in um, not only sort of crime rates and the like, but also adding in these police-related homicides might might get us some in, get us at some interesting questions about the kinds of stress that people are under, the kinds of conditions and their health behaviors, etc. So we're thinking about um, there's a variety of sort of health surveys that we're thinking about kind of merging in and, and thinking about how to model some of this. All right. Hmm. Uh, so I also kind of had this idea based on the aggregated national geotech stuff where you had basically like a little like flag that popped up with like the sort of news summary and then the link. Have you, I know you guys have done a lot of this hand collection, have you thought about using any type of like um, machine learning semantic extraction to basically automate additional like mining of those? Yeah. So basically like a lot of those uh, articles will provide some additional relevant detail, especially when you're talking about sort of like these community-based um, potential impacts. So if it's like the police responded to a domestic disturbance call and then somebody ends up getting shot, um, that's kind of different than if it was an armed robbery of a liquor store and somebody ends up getting shot, like especially as it relates to sort of the impact on communities and stuff. Right, so I mean, we did pull out the, the potential chart or like the, what they were sort of accused of, but you're right that I think we could probably even categorize these as sort of fundamentally different categories. Um, we haven't done this, and so no one on our team does this, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't look for someone who can, because I think there's a lot of data that we're ignoring by not doing that. Um, so that's, that's a great idea. Um, I hesitate to show you this next slide. Um, because all it really is is a model of controls. Um, but I'm just going to show you anyway, um, just because it wouldn't be fun unless. Oops, sorry. Okay, so after this. So there's a variety of questions. I'm sure you guys have already come up with some, um, in addition to um, a variety of sociological questions about race ethnic imbalances. Um, we're still in the process of creating accounts by race ethnicity, which requires that we 
supplement the race ethnicity data first. Um, we can think about the ways that segregation or you know, race ethnic composition matter. Um, we can think about not only various policies and directives, but also training education, body, you know, body cams, car cams, uh, body armor, like all these different sorts of things we can think about. All right. So because I really wanted to show you like some numbers, even though I don't really trust any of them, um, I thought I would run some panel um, Poisson models. So I've, um, and again, this is really only the controls that we're using. We haven't merged into department data, um, department level data. We haven't merged in. Um, we just got the emergency room data. We haven't merged it in. Um, this yet, as of yet, we would probably want to refine this to only the top hundred departments or the largest ones. Right now, it's just all places above twenty-five thousand. This is very heterogeneous group of departments. Um, I've also restricted it just to the last seven years or so. Um, we need to think about your sort of spatial correlation. I, you know, these are not lagged, right? So we can think about a story in which having an officer killed in that year doesn't really, isn't really what's driving the difference in behavior. It's what happened the previous year, right? And even potentially what happened in, you know, sort of contiguous boundary places. Right. So for, for whatever these are worth, which I would argue is not a whole lot, um, we're seeing here sort of expected relationships, at least theoretically. And again, these are, these are coefficients. They're not instant rate ratios, um, but we kind of imagine the sort of size of them if we, if we exponentiate them. So you're seeing sort of positive relationship between violent crime rate and these deaths. Um, again, not surprising. I'm sorry, I'm sorry there's fixed effects and random effects model? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, for Poisson with conditional rent fixed effects. Um, so, yeah, side by side. Um, you see sort of positive relationships with some exception for officers killed in felonious um, acts. Um, not much going on with officers assaulted. And just because I'm curious, although I don't, I don't necessarily believe it at this point, um, I wanted to look at the, the segregation measure. And the reason I, I'm a little suspicious of this, and, and probably a lot of this in general, is that black-white segregation in general has been going down across most geographic areas. So I think it's probably also picking up other things that are going down sort of simultaneously, right? Because it's also partially linearly interpolated, I'm, I'm a little suspicious. So and then this is sorry again. This is this is the geography. This is the the the, the, is the geographic region. Yeah. The, okay. This is the count level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so just looking again at what predicts sort of the count of and again no, this I mean, is only I'm gunshots. So, I'm sorry. No, I mean the the black white segregation where exactly. in in the geographic location that aligns with the police in the in the police department. Okay. Um, but this is something of interest that we definitely want to continue to include these as controls going forward. Uh, I think they're often omitted or at least occasionally omitted. We want to add in our emergency room data. Um, and But key or missing are these department level variables that we're probably most interested in, right? So to the extent to which these will ultimately serve maybe as controls. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that this is necessarily even the, the modeling strategy we'll pursue. There's some really interesting sort of um, spatio-temporal models in which you have sort of a weighted matrix of the contiguous boundaries, and we definitely would want to think about doing something like that given some of the issues we raised about like fleeing across boundaries and, and the like. So um, that's about it. Okay, so any, I think I have a few minutes. Um, any questions? So speaking about the completeness of this um, uh, this FE data, mm -hmm. have you uh, contacted like um, you know some states that has a you know large number of homicide rates, such as Chicago, California, or Georgia? Because I'm seeing the states you contacted are most likely to be the states that has a really few number of homicides. So we're in the process right now of that the department level survey of surveying departments like across the entire U.S. Um, and certainly, I think that will supplement some of what we have. But it, but some of the larger departments are at least in what we can tell sort of mostly better estimates um, because they're also surveyed in a variety of other like sources and some have been pressured to release this information publicly. So like for example. Um, Boston has all this information up online, right? Yeah. So they're trying to be more sort of proactive about sharing this kind of stuff. Okay. 
Um, but what you're thinking about specifically contacting the state or the department? Or like state? Chicago has like a lot of homicide rates. Probably is the amount of like some state in the U.S. Yeah. like within a year. So I'm thinking maybe for those city or those states, there mm -hmm. may be like a larger management error because they have mm -hmm. like a lot of homicides there. And then, okay. yeah, so the, the one that you included in your data set may not be uh, the complete one. But also that Chicago has like this um, crime open data. Right. So they have like the incident level. Um, you can actually check yourself because they, okay. they have like they have a clear definition. Basically, it's please report and they put it online. Okay, I might contact you about that because I mean, we're always looking for other sources to like cross check and maybe if we're missing if we're missing incidents that would definitely be something. To follow up on my house point a little bit though, there, if I think of a city like Chicago where there is actually a lot of you know sort of police related deaths, you run into a problem where I think your measurement error is directly related to the variable that you actually. You know, care. I'm thinking of like a home in Square in Chicago. Nobody knows right. how many people died in there, right? Um, and so you've got you know so much more fuzziness. And I think you know the agency, if you contact them, they have a greater incentive to perhaps not, not be accurate. Yeah, yeah. You know, in those places where the they're higher. So uh, worry just a little bit in terms of you know the, yeah. the verification process. Okay. No, I, I think I think that's right. I think even even if we verify it according to their data set, that doesn't mean we verify yeah. it according to the truth um, yeah. and this is something that a lot of blood criminologists have critiqued this data because there is that there is that incentive maybe to be less than truthful on some of these reports particularly for departments um, and so how do we think how do we think about that and how do we capture that kind of bias yeah maybe, maybe better than nothing um, anything any other questions so as you can see we're still in the midst of um, really early stages, thinking about how to model some of this complexity, some of these challenges. Um, some, of, some of them seem a little insurmountable, but I definitely will keep hopefully relying on you guys in the future to read manuscripts and, and give me some feedback. So I appreciate your, your coming. Mm -hmm. So is this data already available for researchers to use, or is it, and you guys have a time and like a deadline that it's going to be good? It is not. <coughs> Encounters data, like just the incident level file, is available. Okay. Um, and certainly the other pieces separately, by and large, are available. You'd have to do a bit of background work. Sure. But we're going to put together sort of like a normalized version, create variables across time that are sort of similar in measurement. So that won't be, um, we're hoping to release it at some point next year, maybe the end of the spring or the, you know, summer at the latest. But depends to what we need to get some stuff to do. But that's the goal. That's the goal of like our to release it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, this is like the dish of academia. No, I think like, 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 why, uh, why would you not, why are you releasing it ahead of a paper? I mean, <laughs> we could. I mean, that's, like, for that's, that's a very <laughs> few large public good, yeah. but why wouldn't you just wait to no, release I mean, it until you publish something and then everybody who uses it has to cite you? True. I mean, right now we have a this this white paper, which is just about the data in general that we feel like we need to have out there in the world so that we can even cite it as a reputable source. Um, we're definitely working. We're going to start working on papers in the spring. So we'll, our, maybe we'll be ambitious that we would get enough out by the time we release it. That, but I the, definitely take that. That's an NI, NIH probably yeah. was a big part of the, the proposal to get and I, yes. so I, 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 can, I can say I can I, I can say for sure so I'll, I'll, I'll reveal it so 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 Audrey's also got a, you know part of her research fellowship with CHEP so sort of based on sort of further work for this project and when I when we sent the proposal she wrote up for, for another part of this project beyond the NIH stuff out to sort of a labor economist he wrote back in all caps this is going to be made public question mark then I rate it 19 out of 10 <laughs> <laughs> But that's, yeah, I mean, I imagine that was an important part of the NIH. Yeah. No, that so was, in part, fact, that was sort of the thrust of the proposal, that yeah. we're going to create this and release it as a public good. Okay. And let's, you just got to get, get yours, right? Yeah. Whether it's like decisions <laughs> or like a grant, that. something. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Well, that means I have a really busy spring. Yeah, so. All right, thank you guys. I know this is a lot out of your comfort zone, so I appreciate, I appreciate all your feedback. Um, and please feel free, I'd love to, if you have specific questions, as I mentioned, I do have like all the variables across years for all these, and I can easily probably tell you whether something's available and what years it's available, so you can always shoot me an email. That's good. Fantastic. Thanks so much.